Hi, welcome to the new video in the System Design Building Block series. Today we will talk about protocols and patterns to transfer data between the client and server. I consider this video to be the most important among others, because communication between the client and server is knowledge that is needed possibly in every interview, regardless of the subject. Such information would be useful not only for front-end developers, but also for mobile developers. It turns out there is more information that I had planned, so I have divided it into three videos. This is the first one, where we look at the problem of client-server communication in general and discuss the most distributed pattern for such types of communications, REST. Before we begin, it's important to understand what types of communications exist. The first question that we have to ask yourself is who is consumer of our API? Based on the answer, we can allocate two types. The first one is client to server communication. Such communications implies that we have a client, which may be a browser, PWA, or for example, mobile application, and a remote server that provides API to the clients. The next one is service to service communication. I did not call it server to server because the word service better represents reality. A server is a physical computer that may host one or more services. Therefore, when I say service, I mean that the provided API that may be hosted on one or many servers or in the cloud. It doesn't matter for us. The main difference between a client and a service is that a service is not a human user. The difference here is that on the client side, many people may want to read the response. Remember that the company consists not only of programmers. For example, the testing team needs to read responses as well. That's why when we are talking about client-server communications, human readability and convenience of using API are sometimes more important than performance. The next question is, who will use our API? Will it be used only inside the company or is it for public usage? We also call such API private and public or first party and third party accordingly. Today we will mostly discuss client-server communication. Because client-server communication may also be public or private, we will also discuss which approach is more efficient in both cases. What options do we have? We can use REST, GraphQL, gRPC, tRPC, WebSockets and others. We are not limited to only these protocols and patterns. However, in my opinion, these options are the most popular today, so we will talk about some of them. Before we start, it's important to understand how today's problem is related to the system design interview or to designing web applications. For many developers, especially for those not senior, using REST looks like the default option for API. When during the interview or in usual life, they are asked to design an API for client-server communication, they immediately jump into the details of the realization. All these things are important, but possibly not in the interview. Your main goal is to provide a clear signal. This signal must be that you know alternatives to REST, you understand the advantages and disadvantages of each approach. You know when you should apply such a protocol or pattern and when you shouldn't. The only exclusion from this rule is when the interviewer asks you about the implementation details. In such cases, you should do this. Otherwise, you risk getting deeply absorbed in the nuances because the interviewer timeline is limited. Does that mean that REST is a bad choice? Not necessarily. When developers use the word REST, they usually don't mean what REST actually is. We will discuss later what it means. What most developers call REST can still be a good choice in many cases. There is not a coincidence that REST is used as a default option in many cases. You must select it explicitly in the interview if you choose to use it in your application. That's the key point. No matter if you decide to use REST or GraphQL or something else, you must do it explicitly. What does it mean? You should tell the interviewer why you choose this option, why it's better in our case. Don't forget to highlight the disadvantages of it and how you plan to manage them if you can. Let's look at the agenda. We will discuss four different protocols and patterns which are mostly used for client-server APIs. We will discuss REST, GraphQL, gRPC, tRPC. Next, we will look at the whole picture and consider a couple of examples of implementing such protocols in real-world applications. 
And finally, I will give you some useful tips for the interview. What we will not discuss today. The first thing that we will not discuss today is SOAP or Simple Object Access Protocol. It's a protocol that was popular before REST and I don't know too many applications that use SOAP today. To be honest, I know zero. It doesn't mean that they don't exist, but due to its low popularity nowadays, we will leave it out of scope. And WebSockets. WebSocket is a protocol for bidirectional transferring of data. We will not discuss it today because I believe that real-time messaging is a huge topic that should be separated from usual data transferring. Fortunately, I have a whole video where I talk about different options for real-time communications. And we also closely look at WebSockets. On the top of the screen, I will add a link to this video and I will also put a link into the description of this video. Let's look at the first candidate for client-server communications, REST. REST, which stands for Representational State Transfer, is an architectural style for designing networked applications. The principles of REST are outlined by Roy Felding in his doctoral dissertation. I will add a link to the dissertation in the description. I did not read it fully, but if you're curious and you have enough time, you can do that. Here are the six key principles of REST. Uniform interface, statelessness, cache ability, client-server architecture, layered system, and code on demand, which is optional principle. Many developers use REST but don't know these principles. This is the first warning signal. How can we use REST and not know the key pillars of it? We can't say it is REST or something else if we do not know how to build REST. To close this gap, let's look at each principle closer. The first principle is the uniform interface. How we can implement it in reality? I could distinguish three points. The first one is resource identification. REST API uses uniform resource identifiers to address resources. For example, a user might be identified by a URI like api.example.com slash users slash 123, where 123 is a user's ID. Self-descriptive messages. The server includes headers like content type in the response, which is needed to correctly parse the message. We do not need to know how to parse the message in advance. We can get all information from the response. And hate OS. The server response might include Kubernetes links like api.site.com slash users slash 123, guiding the client on how to perform further actions. All these principles reach the one goal, make API more discoverable and, as a result, less coupled with the backend. Any client can take and use such API without too much documentation or another help. If the first two points, I think, are relatively understandable, the third one may be a little bit confused, especially if you haven't heard this acronym before. Head OS stands for Kubernetes as the engine of application state. It is needed to provide not just the requested data, but also links or instructions on what actions you can take next. How do we usually work with REST API? Through JavaScript code, we request data from the server. Let's say it's a list of users. If we need to request more information about a certain user, we need to parse the response, get the user's ID, and send another request to the server. That's the way most developers are used to working with REST API. Head OS implies another way. Each entity in the response must also include a link to this entity. Instead of returning just the user's IDS, the backend also returns a link to this user. Why is Head OS important? It makes API more discoverable. It reduces dependency on fixed URLs, and it allows for dynamic changes without breaking client functionality. In terms of uniform interface, it means that the client is less dependent on the backend and documentation. Theoretically, a client can request a list of users and after that request any other data without using documentation. Jumping by links in the responses. Hate OS must be included in a correctly built REST API. Let's see how it works on a blog platform. The client requests users' data. It includes name, ID, and a list of links to the list of articles that were written by the user. Going through this link, the client requests the list of articles. 
The client also wants to get the list of comments for each article. The response also includes links to the comments. And finally, we can receive the list of comments. Here is how, in three steps, the client received all the user articles with comments without referring to the documentation. The next principle is statelessness. How it works? The server doesn't store the client state between requests. Each request is independent. You may ask, what about authorized requests? Session implies that we have state on the server. Yes, that's true, but each request is still independent of the others. Each request contains session information in the HTTP header or cookies. So using session does not violate statelessness principle. If each request acts independently and does not refer to the previous requests and responses, we may say that such a principle is satisfied. Next principle is cacheability. Responses from the server should be labeled as a cacheable or non-cacheable. Cache control headers like cache control are used to specify caching behavior. Caching might be implemented on multiple levels, in the browsers, in the proxy server, in CDN, etc. Let's see how it works. When the client requests data from the server, the request response might be cached on a different layer. It might be cached on a CDN and reverse proxy layer, on the proxy layer, and finally on the client layer in the browser. If the server sets correct cache headers, the response will be cached in the browser. Caching in other layers is a them for another video. Next principle is client service architecture. The client server design keeps separated website view from the data. This makes it easier to use the same view on different devices. It also helps websites adapt and grow without everything getting mixed up. In other words, the client doesn't need to know about the construction of the server to interact with API. It makes client less dependent on backend realization. On the schema, clients interact with the internet while backend realization keeps hidden for them. The next principle is the layer system. When you are using internet, you usually can't tell if you are talking directly to a website or through something in the middle. If there is a middleman like a proxy or load balancer, it won't disrupt your communication and you don't have to change anything on your computer or the website. This principle looks similar to the previous one, but here we hide from the client the complex infrastructure between the client and the server. This principle, like the previous one, helps keep the client independent from the backend realization. And the last principle, which is optional, is code on demand. Servers can temporarily extend or customize the functionality of a client by transferring executable code, for example, JavaScript code. In other words, the server can send code to the client, which must be executed. The next thing we have to discuss is the difference between REST and RESTful API, which sometimes may be confused. REST is a pattern that includes six principles that we have discussed before, with which an API must be constructed. A RESTful API is an API that follows REST principles. Previously, I mentioned that not all REST API are really REST API. If there are not REST API, what are they? Today, REST is mostly a buzzword. Most API don't follow at least the hate OS principle and cannot be called RESTful. Usually, when something is called REST API, it means that the API uses nouns to describe entities, not verbs. The API uses some semantic features of HTTP, like get for requesting data, delete for deletion, etc. But sometimes not all of them. For example, in REST, put and patch must be used for different cases. Data is transferred in JSON format most of the time. REST is protocol agnostic, therefore we can use JSON or anything else. However, most REST API use JSON for transferring data. It is not RPC or GraphQL API. We have no special word for an API that is not a GraphQL or RPC, but at the same time doesn't follow all REST principles. So we simply call it REST API. We can use the word REST foolish to describe an API that uses some of the REST principles, but may follow or may not follow them all. But this is not an official terminology. We finally finished with preparations and are ready to take a closer look at the practical side of REST. Some guides mention advantages of HTTP, such as caching, as advantages of REST, which is not true. REST is just a pattern, not a technology. It might be applied over HTTP or theoretically over any other protocol. 
The reason why REST is perfectly suited to HTTP is because HTTP was designed to be compatible with the REST. So when we are talking about REST advantages, we should separate advantages of REST as a pattern and REST over HTTP as the most popular application of REST. Let's start with advantages of REST as an architectural pattern. The first advantage is flexibility. REST typically works over HTTP but can work over any other protocol. Compatibility with HTTP. HTTP was designed to be suitable for REST, therefore REST is very suitable for the web. And low coupling. The client and server are less coupled to each other if the REST API is built correctly. When we implement REST with HTTP and JSON, we get the following advantages. Simplicity. REST provides a comprehensible set of rules. HTTP is a widely distributed and familiar protocol to many developers, as is JSON, which provides human-readable messages. All of these factors make such a combination easy to integrate into the application and maintain. Another thing is that most of the infrastructure knows how to work with HTTP, which additionally facilitates maintenance. Browser support HTTP caching. If the server puts the correct cache header into the response, we don't need to do anything special to make caching workable. Easy of debugging. JSON is a human-readable format. We can also send requests to the server from any client. And rich toolkit. Besides the broad support for HTTP as a technology, there are many tools, packages, and libraries to work with HTTP. Today, REST is still a very popular solution for new projects. However, you may hear many criticism about REST as well. Let's look at some problems of REST. The first one is overfetching. Overfetching is fetching too much data, which means that there is a data in the response that are not using on the client. Underfetching is not fetching enough data when calling an endpoint, forcing you to call a second endpoint. REST requires versioning to ensure backward compatibility. This requires additional cost and complexity. Uncontrollable number of endpoints. When the API becomes large, it becomes difficult to maintain endpoints and update documentation. It mostly suited for crude operations. When we try to create an API more complex than crude, it becomes impossible to stay within the REST architecture and provide a clear and usable API. The major part of these disadvantages is related to the fact that REST is relatively old. REST was introduced in 2000 when the web was different. The major part of the web consists of websites which were not as complex as modern web applications. It means that in many scenarios we just don't know how to implement something correctly and keep the application within REST boundaries. Another thing about REST is that it doesn't have some mechanism to validate data. Other options which we will discuss today have schemas or data typings, but REST doesn't. The problem is, on the client side, we cannot know what we received from the backend and we don't have built-in solution to validate it. We also mentioned over- and under-fetching as disadvantages of REST. Let's look closer at each problem because it will be important for the further story. What is overfetching? As we said earlier, overfetching is fetching too much data which is not needed on the client. Let's look at the example. We have a comment section on the side. The client needs to display the username and profile image in the comment section near the comment. The client requests user's data from the server by user ID. The server sends all user's fields even if the client does not need all of them. It is called overfetching. Overfetching is a problem because it leads to inefficient use of users' traffic, increased data transfer times, and unnecessary consumption of server resources. However, it's important to say that overfetching may not be a big problem for your application. If your main audience is desktop users and overfetching is not too big, we could simply do nothing with it. Or we can fix it. We can use GraphQL instead of REST. We possibly do not need to rewrite the application from REST to GraphQL because of a couple of redundant fields in the response. However, if it became a massive problem, we should at least consider such an option. We can use sparse field sets. We discuss later what it is. We can just add an additional endpoint which returns a shortened number of fields. 
or we can just add extra parameters to the existing one to configure the set of fields. Sparse fields is a technique of adding required fields to the URL. We can send a set of required fields separated by a comma. The problem we may face is what if 2083 characters maximum URL length in Edge are not enough? We can easily imagine the situation for sites like Amazon when customers can configure many filters to display appropriate products. If 2,083 characters are not enough, we can use POST and put the included fields in the body, but then it's not longer REST, because we can't use POST to retrieve the data. Another option is to add an extra parameter to the endpoint. For example, short parameter to get a limited number of fields. The problem arises when the number of parameters gets too large and it becomes difficult to remember them all and keep the documentation up to date. Such solution is not very flexible. What if we need a different set of fields elsewhere? The next problem is underfetching. Underfetching is the opposite of overfetching. We need more fields or entities that backend can return. So we have to make additional requests to get all the required data. Let's take an example with an article and comments to this article. We need to display the article comments and the user who left such comment. There are three different entities and therefore three different requests. We cannot request all data in one request, so we have to do three. It would be very convenient if we could group all these data in one request, right? Why is it a problem? Because it leads to incomplete or insufficient data receiving, which can result in extra requests, increased latency and a worse user experience. So how can we fix such a problem? We can add an additional endpoint. We can use GraphQL instead of REST, or we can ask the backend team to add fields. We discussed the first two points earlier, so let's look at the third one. When the endpoint doesn't have all the needed fields, we can simply ask the backend team to add them, right? Such solution has two problems. The first one increases coupling between frontend and backend teams which might be undesirable depending on the structure of teams in the company, and it makes endpoint less unified. Adding fields to an endpoint may result in overfetching for other teams in cases when the API is used by more than one team. Problems may happen even within one project if endpoints are used in multiple places. And the bonus solution, we can add fields ourselves. If we have a full stack team, it makes the problem a little bit easier, but doesn't eliminate the problem of unification that we discussed before. The main purpose of REST is to be unified. In other words, it must work well with different protocols, teams, and customers. Such unification is the main advantage and at the same time the main disadvantage of REST. It is suitable in many cases, but a unified solution cannot really shine in any scenarios. We will look at the approaches which are less flexible but more efficient in terms of performance, reliability and providing better developer experience. But now let's look at cases where REST can be good. The first case is a public API. Most developers are more comfortable with the REST API. We can support multiple APIs, not on the REST. However, REST API is the default for public APIs. A simple application with mostly crude operations. REST is the point at which we can start looking at other protocols. If we don't know why we need GraphQL or RPC, REST is our choice. In reality, the second scenario covers a huge part of the websites and web applications. We shouldn't add complexity when it is not needed. Even if using another approach might be beneficial, don't forget about the simplicity of adding REST and try to keep balance. The opposite is also true. Using REST for complex applications may turn the API into legacy unsupported code soon after the start of development. That's why system design is very important. We should consider things like scalability and cost of maintaining the system before starting development. Let's look at cases when we should possibly use something else rather than REST. Overfetching or underfetching is a problem. Over and underfetching leads to increased traffic consumption, which can be a problem for mobile devices. In such cases, GraphQL should be used instead. Complex response structure in cases where we have to build a complex response structure on the backend side or send many requests on the frontend, it may make sense to switch to GraphQL in these cases.
and microservices on the backend side. REST is not very suitable for service-to-service -service communications. There are reasons why. REST is slow. REST was not designed to be efficient. Usability was the top priority. REST is never native. REST is protocol independent. This is good for a variety of web applications because we can apply REST to any of them. However, when speed is critical, we usually prefer native approaches. What we can use instead? RPC approaches, for example, gRPC for synchronous operations because they are usually faster, and RabbitMQ or other queues for pop sub like operations. Backend is not our area of responsibility, but it's useful to know when REST is not very useful. We have finished the first part. In the next video, we will look at GraphQL and RPC approaches. Thank you for watching.